You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today. Welcome to The Fader Interview. I'm Alex Robert Ross, Editorial Director of The Fader. Joe Casey has entered a new stage of life. After a decade as the self-consciously miserable frontman and lyricist of the Detroit post-punk institution Proto Martyr, culminating in 2020's ultimate success today, he's trying out a new, guardedly hopeful mode of existence. Proto Martyr's next project, Formal Growth in the Desert, is no stroll in the park, but it's easily the most optimistic entry into their emphatically cynical body of work. Part of Casey's thematic pivot has been circumstantial. He got engaged and in May married, which inspired a move from the crumbling family home on Six Mile, where he's lived out the vast majority of his 46 years on earth, to the more suburban Nine Mile, making him, in his own words, one mile less cool than Eminem. The love in his life, as well as the global pause brought on by the pandemic, also gave him the push he needed to work on himself after decades of neglect. It was, he told the faders Raphael Helfand last month, a way out during dark times. Still, it would be a ridiculous stretch to say that Casey now sees the world through rose-tinted glasses. The main factors that prompted his move out of the neighborhood he grew up in were not only new love, but also his mother's death after a long struggle with Alzheimer's disease, and a series of break-ins that occurred the first time his then-girlfriend, now wife, came to visit his home city. The robberies, to which Detroit police responded with apparently complete indifference, are the subject of We Know the Rats, a standout near the end of the new album. Elsewhere, formal growth works in pairs. On Graft vs. Host, Casey plums the gulf between the happiness is a cloudless sky he knows his mother wishes for him, and the van to black in a starless sky he actually feels in her absence. But later, on the author, he celebrates her life from a much more accepting perspective. On Polar Krillex Kid, he asks the question, can you hate yourself and still deserve love? And on the album's closer, Rain Garden, he answers it. I am deserving of love, he sings, as dense guitar chords and heavy drum fills crash around him, radiating a serenity unprecedented in his earlier work. In conversation with Raphael, Casey touched on his newfound confidence, as well as Wild Tigers, The Detroit Tigers, Love, Late Capitalism, Stage Fright, Weak Ankles, and Grief. Thank you for accepting this interview. I accepted this interview because I actually have a bone to pick, which is that I sprained my ankle pretty bad at your show at uh, Elsewhere. And so I'm wondering if you can uh, explain yourself for all the rowdy young proto motor fans that uh, that did that to me. Was there an actual pit? There was a pit, uh, yeah. Okay. I was surprised and then I was embarrassed that I'd sprained my ankle at the proto motor pit. I mean, I think I'm I'm ashamed for you to bring it up. It's the most, <laughs> yeah. You can't go out and say, oh yeah, I sprained my ankle. Oh, uh, at a show. Oh, what show? proto motor show. I mean, we have lots of elderly people in our audience that might fall over and break a hip, but... Hey, I got, I've got weak ankles, you know, it's, it's not on you. Okay. Yeah, so jumping right into it. In interviews like surrounding Ultimate Success Today, you talked about that album as sort of the end of an era or the, of, a, of a decade of Proto-Martyr. So did making formal growth in the desert feel to you like the start of something new, more so than other records have? Well, what I was saying that I was setting myself up and I didn't realize that there was going to be uh, quarantine and COVID and all that, so... It seemed like I was saying, like, we're done. And then COVID hit, and then it felt like, well, maybe we are done because we don't know when we're going to tour. You know, money's not rolling in. And most importantly, uh, creatively, we were just completely sapped. I didn't think about songs. Greg did not pick up a guitar for a year. And so when we were starting working on this record, it was kind of a benefit when I was like, you know, Greg, during all those interviews, I was saying, like, that was the end of a chapter. So we're able to just come up with anything and it doesn't we don't have to be like oh we gotta work on a new proto-martyr record it can just we can just try to work on music and uh 
I kind of gave us an out a little bit where we can start afresh. And so that kind of released the pressure of coming off of the year of not doing shit and then being like forced to ca- recapture the magic or whatever the hell. So yes, this was a, f- a long, long answer. This was a, a fresh start just because of less of me saying for any like musical reasons or uh, poetic reasons and more just the fact that it was the longest that we had gone without doing anything and starting again, sort of. Yeah, I mean, I think this period of time after like what we all hope is like the darkest part of the pandemic uh, feels like a bit like that for a lot of people. I know you recently got engaged too. So without, you know, being too savvy about it, I have, have you been feeling more, more hopeful lately in a lot of ways? Yeah. I mean, that's, um, I mean, it's kind of like an underlying theme of the record going through pretty dark period for us, for me, the band, for a lot of people. And then, whereas before our Proto Martyr record might be like just pointing out how miserable and pointless life is, this is like, okay, that is a valid feeling. How do you get out of it without it being, um, without being too cheesy about it or being too like, you know, every cloud has a silver lining kind of thing where it's like realistic ways to continue living after something like that. And uh, yeah, so I mean, obviously getting engaged is a, it's a great thing. It's positive. Uh, and it ends, the album ends, I think, on an upbeat note, whereas we usually like to pull the rug at the end. You've been known to like kind of connect the closer of one album to the opener of the next one. So like in this case, do you feel like sort of like the, what do you call it, like open existentialism of like Warm in Heaven is like the precursor to like the more like future oriented make way? Yeah, I mean, Worm in Heaven basically is a funeral song. It's like to be played at my funeral. Like it really is like a bye-bye, so long, see you later song. And then with this one, it wasn't always the first song make way, but then um, it kind of, it was pretty obvious early on that it was going to be the first song. And just from a musical standpoint, I learned, you know, I don't know anything about chords or keys or anything like that, but Greg is like, oh, it's in the same key. And then I just figured like, well, after the years of COVID where, you know, millions of people died and everybody kind of was face to face with death and mortality. Now the, the living still have to exist, you know, and, and a non-religious sort of uh, rapture way. Like everybody's gone and now the people that remain have to continue on. So that kind of connected lyrically to the last one. And then we ended up having uh, the same director direct both Worm and Head in this one. And he made some allusions to both videos. So it ended up being more tied than maybe we had planned originally. Maybe it's just the chorus, but like Make Way feels like sort of like an especially anthemic opener for like a Proto Martyr album. And like the statement at the end, Make Way for Tomorrow, feels like like a much more direct like call to action than you usually write. And like even though there are some certainly like some dark themes to that song, like it doesn't feel like a completely like ironic call to action. The most interesting thing about going through the COVID stuff was um, everybody's like, oh, it's over, you know, stop wearing masks, stop, uh, it's over. And everyone kind of had a collective delusion that it was back to business, you know. That is also kind of the thing, as you get older, you realize that they're, like my family's, gen- my parents' generation, they're all dying off. Like I, I've been to too many funerals of just, and it's not because of COVID, it's just because they're old and they're dying off. And then to realize like, oh, you know, my generation's going to start dying off. You have to come to terms with the past is dying and what's coming behind you is coming and you can be against it or you can kind of accept it. So I don't know if it's mostly like, hey, let's make way for tomorrow. It's more like, well, tomorrow is coming whether you want to or not. So how you handle it is up to you. Came upon a spavin horse And trampled through our home But we didn't do anything Because no one owes anyone Obviously, the final lyrics to the track are Make Way for Tomorrow, and then the next song is For Tomorrow. That song, I assume that this fair city is Detroit. Um, you mentioned both the special way, which, if Google serves me right, is an auto parts store. Uh, liquor store. Party store. Okay. Google did not serve me right. Um, uh, and you also mentioned an art gallery. So, I mean, I guess 
I'm getting this question wrong here, but I would I was going to ask you. So you're sort of like hinting at both like the city's industrial past and like its gentrifying present a bit, maybe. Yeah, I mean, the last song ends with like "Make way for tomorrow," like you said, kind of like a bold statement. And then for me, and for especially during COVID, uh, I'm a very lazy person, so I'm like I'll put it off till tomorrow. Tomorrow's when I'm going to start really working, and then immediately I am like, well, I wake up and then I'm like, well. Time to go back to bed. Like I don't. It's, it's so it was kind of capturing the mental state of that sort of thing, and then especially in Detroit, you could either go to the liquor store and you know we call them party stores here. Go to the party store and you know get some booze and go back, and that will be your day. Or you know this new art gallery is popping up. It's sort of like a new kind of uh, you know. It's kind of a lazy person's uh, a person that maybe is depressed anthem in a sense like you're trying to be creative you're trying to get out and do things but uh lethargies is pulling you down the reason those lines like i saw you outside the special way i saw you outside the gallery is this in detroit uh, detroit's actually a very small fairly small city because everybody you know left and then in the uh, scene if you will that's even smaller so even if you don't know everybody you definitely recognize everybody so if you go like to an art gallery opening or something like that or go to a liquor store you're bound to at least recognize the people that are there. It's kind of like that thing where you first poke your head out of uh, the quarantine and you're, you know, oh, that guy's still alive or, you know, that person's still here. It's kind of like that sort of the daylight of the new day is coming in. You're wiping, you're wiping your your, uh, sleep away and say, oh, there's somebody over there I recognize, you know, and we're all going through it. You moved out of your like kind of iconic family home in 2021, right? Yes. What was that move like and like where are you staying now and how has it changed the lens through which you view your city, if at all? Well, I was thinking, I guess, I guess we moved out in last year, 2022. And, you know, as you said, I, I got engaged and I convinced somebody to move to Detroit, which is, uh, that's a point for me. And the thing was the week that she moved, we were staying at an Airbnb and I was like, oh, I can't wait to show you the house. You know, it's needs a lot of work, but we can probably live there for a while, you know, because trying to buy a house now is impossible. And the week that she was in town for the first time in my existence and the existence of us living in the house, the house was broken into and not only broken into once, it was broken into four times in the span of two weeks. And that was all while you were staying at the Airbnb? Right. Yeah. And it was the first time it happened. And it was right the week when she had like, I'm moving to Detroit. And so it was like, this doesn't usually happen. Uh, And so, and then, I called the cops and the cops said, uh, do you have a security system? And I was like, no, no, I don't have a security system. Like, do you have a gun? I was like, no. And they said, well, um, it's going to keep happening unless you do get something like that. And it's... Get something like a security system or a gun. It was the cop equivalent of you had it coming, basically. And they're like, we'll send a detective. Nobody ever came. You know, so each time I'm getting broken into, I'm calling them up. Uh, my neighbor down the street gave me a letter. They had the wrong address. They were sending stuff to the wrong address. It just was like well, that's not going to be solved. And the thing is, with the as it was d- developing, you realize you go from really hating the thief because we're taking away your sense of you know safety and things, but then you start wondering, like, well, why is this guy breaking into my house? Because there really isn't much. He went through everything, and it was 60 years of accumulated junk and, and, and mementos and important things to us, but, like, basically he had to go through a lot of junk and not find too much. Like, the most important thing that I lost was a laptop that had all the proto-martyr demos and and things on it but after a while you're just like well the guy's breaking into my house because he needs the money and why does he need the money well in detroit right now there's not a lot of jobs housing is ridiculous you know people are buying these cheap houses and slapping some shitty paint on it and raising the price to where no one can afford it and so i i slowly stopped being mad at the thief and then was mad at the cops for just basically ignoring me and then i was mad at the systems that made it so. And so it quickly went from just being this, oh man, I, I'm scared of, of being broken into to being like, I'm, I'm scared of a system that makes you scared of your neighbor, that you have to be afraid that you're going to get broken into, you know, that makes you think, oh, I got to worry about the immigrants stealing my job. Like the thing that points you towards other people went from being something very specific to something very abstract. And that's uh, We Know the Rats. That's that song. Could have happened to anyone that kept through the back room. But they came again We know the rats Call the cops, see what they do Scam calls to the wrong address Clever pigs never get 
mattress Yeah, we know the last These things have you sleeping rough Things were bad to meet you young So your mind, Harry's bigger ones Are you still in the same part of the city or are you in a whole different part? I'm a little bit outside of the city now, unfortunately. I went from living on McNichols, which is six miles, to now I'm on nine miles. I'm one mile less cool than Eminem now because I'm no longer on eight miles. My brother had a house, the house where he was taking care of my mom. Uh, once she passed away, he went and tr- bought a farm way out in the country. So I was able to get that house. If not, we would have been shit out of luck because, yeah. Buying a house is impossible now. And we only have a 30-year mortgage now, so I'm sure being in proto martyr will help pay for that. Has living outside the city for, like, the first time since college, right? Has that, like, helped? Has, have you had, like, any revelations about it just from living outside of it or no? No, not yet because it's we just moved here in December. It's a little bit sad, and I have friends that are moving into the city. It's sort of a different feeling now. We're like, I always lived on the northwest side. I was never in a cool neighborhood. There wasn't, like... You know, people were moving into like the more cool where there's like restaurants and things to do. I was always in like just a neighborhood. So they're having a lot of fun enjoying the good parts of the city. And I, I kind of regret that I couldn't stay, but I had to go where I could get a house. <laughs> Jumping back to uh, to Make Way, that song mentions a spavined horse. And I'll admit I had to look that word up. It made me naturally think about the cover of Ultimate Success Today. Um, is that a spavined horse? Uh, that's a mule. I'm obsessed with mules and donkeys. Uh, mules because they are uh, the offspring of a horse and a donkey, and they're all, uh, I was going to say celibate. No, they, can, they, they, they can't have kids, basically. They're, uh, they, they can still fuck, but they just, yeah, they, they're all, uh, you know, can't have kids. So, and that was, I had references to mules on that record. But uh, apparently somebody I saw when the song came out, people were like, wow, Joe sure makes a lot of references to horses. I do like horses a lot, but it's never been the plan. It's kind of the thing where, uh, with the band Perubu, someone pointed out, like, wow, like he sure writes about birds a lot, and and you kind of look at like, well, he sure does. You know, it's like it's one of those things where you have a certain uh, couple of things that you like talking about, and they just kind of bubble to the top, I guess. Well, once again, my next question is a little bit less relevant, but speaking of album covers with horses on them, some people were a bit bothered when Ice Age released uh, their horse cover album, Seek Shelter, <laughs> a year after yours did. Um, do you want to take this as an opportunity to clear the air on that or like talk some shit alternatively? No, I would never. Uh, Ice Age is one of those bands that uh, started a little bit before us. And definitely when we started, it was like, it was us and Ice Age and Parquet Courts and Tyvek. And it was like a, a preoccupations. Uh, it was like a much smaller... There wasn't people saying, like, there's a new post-punk thing, you know. Specifically with the uh, Seek Shelter cover, I like that it's a weird-looking horse. It's, like, kind of white. And, and I mean, we're not the first. Since I've, you know, it's a mule on ours. It's a horse on theirs. So there's no no harm, no foul there. And, you know, horses are cool. Put them on your album cover. I don't think people talk enough about, like, Pretty Martyr's sense of humor, which I really admire. And, like, when I saw you perform that fateful night at elsewhere um yes when they were out to get you yeah exactly (laughs) that was my first time seeing you even though i'd wanted to for a long time and um i saw what i'd heard everybody talking about firsthand which was like you carrying like six beers in your coat pocket and i know that 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 was like initially a, a defense mechanism against stage fright for you but is any part of it like sort of a bit at this point it still is stage fright and i think if i ever stopped having stage fright then I'd be really frightened where I'm like, oh, what the fuck? If I just walked out there and was like, time for a show. So I'm glad I still have it because it, it, it's the fire that keeps me going. It is a bit in the sense that you could have like a stage hand or somebody take your beers out for you. But two things about that is sometimes they might be too warm by the time you get them. And also, as a fella, I find it annoying to have to bend over to get a beer and, you know, that constant bending over is just annoying and I don't look very good when I'm doing it. So usually the pockets, I used to put, uh, I used to like request if I could either a small table or a stool. The problem is when you play places that have a uh, sub bass, the, it vibrates. And so it will slowly like, and then the cans will just fall out. And, you know, so the pockets are kind of the way to go with that. Do they not get too warm in the coat pockets? Do you have some sort of cooling mechanism? They do a little bit, and that's why you have to drink them fast. It's another reason to keep drinking them. Yeah. 
Well, back to the music. Yeah, not to linger too long on that image of like the death-filled rider on a spavined horse. But yeah, when I when I looked up the word spavin, I know it's a non-septic bone disease similar to arthritis. And you've spoken like in the past about dealing with arthritis and like the degeneration of the body with age in general. So do you identify more as the spavined horse or the death-filled rider? Uh, definitely not the death-filled rider. I, you know, it's as a rider, you try to, you know, you want uh, specific imagery and you could say a, a death-filled rider on a sickly horse, or I, I, I decided to put death-filled because I thought that was, uh, you don't want to say, here comes death. You know, there's so many songs where here comes death. It's more like, here's a guy so full of death that, you know, wherever he goes, people die. And then Spavins is just, uh, I think I saw an old movie where they're like, you you know, I wouldn't buy that horse, he's Spavins, you know, and so that's just kind of a bony-ass horse that can barely walk, you know. It was interesting is, there's always a very, especially in English, there's always a very specific word for exactly what you're trying to uh, envision. And unfortunately, sometimes those are fairly obscure words. And you don't want to, it's a balance between being direct and you don't want to overload your song with too many uh, references that people have to Google because then it's like, you're reaching no one but yourself, you know. So, but you throw them in occasionally, then it keeps the ear like, what the, what the fuck did you just say? And so... Occasionally that works. So I know you wrote this album in like the wake of your mother's passing from Alzheimer's. And like, first off, are you are you comfortable discussing that at all in the interview? Sure. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people go through it. My grandmother passed that way a few years ago. So I've seen like what it does to a person's body and mind and like also what it does to their loved ones as they become like increasingly distant and nonverbal and dependent and et cetera. So you've written lyrics like describing the horrors of Alzheimer's in the past. Like I think like like Why Does It Shake is one of my favorite proto modern songs. And I think it's like by far the best like musical representation of Alzheimer's. And but on formal growth in the desert, you're reckoning more with your mother's absence than like with her disease. So like there's two sides to that coin. Uh there's graft versus host, which is about like the sort of like the all encompassing blackness of uh, of grief. And I love the contrast of like happiness in a cloudless sky, which is what you imagine your mother wants for you, and like a Vanta black Vanta black in a starless sky, which is like how you actually feel. I'm assuming. So how do you find like a balance between those two uh, poles, and like as well as like the third thrown in there, like the sort of like the uncomfortable feeling of relief that like inevitably inevitably comes when like someone you love passes after like so many years of suffering. Right. It's an interesting thing because like you said the. Uh like when my my grandmother died of alzheimer's so she had alzheimer's and then we had brought her into the family house and you know my mom was worried that my dad wouldn't like it but my dad my dad grew up kind of an orphan so he was very you know he was like oh yes come in like like grandma can stay with us and so we got to see firsthand grandma going through it but that's your grandma you know that's an old lady that you you've but that's been old since you were a child and so you don't really think, you know, and my mom, obviously the thing with Alzheimer's is it's, it goes, it goes down the family line. So my mom was always, she's like, I don't want to be a burden to you boys if I ever get it. After my dad died, it was almost kind of immediate. Like I think the grief of my dad dying kind of like as exacerbated the, uh, that. And so she kind of quickly started losing memory and being able to do things pretty quick after dad died. It was a, a decade long kind of slow spiral to the end. And if anybody that has been through it is it's impossible to explain because it's a thing where it's somebody that you love and you watch them slowly drain away. So her death was very sad, but I almost had a decade to, to grieve her, you know? So it was much different than my dad dying, who died suddenly. And so the first Graf versus host, there's two, yeah, like you said, there's two songs. Graf versus host um, was one that we wrote early. I, remember when they came to take her body out of this house, which is my brother's house at the time, we were both together, like just trying to really, instead of just sitting there kind of blankly, like really try to think about what I was feeling and what I was seeing. And just immediately that feeling of like, well, you know, that, that light is now out. And what would she want me to do? She wouldn't want me to be like sad about this because it was a relief and, you know, and she was a very happy person. But that's easier said than done. And the music that the band had written had this amazing coda to it where I was like, I, that is expressing more emotion than anything I could say. I don't want to gum it up with words, you know? And then with the author, Greg kind of wrote a fairly upbeat song. He was surprised that I was like, oh, this is going to be like another mom song, but it's going to be more about like celebrating her and being like, well, I got to get through it. 
And again, that song had a coda where I'm like, that expresses more than words could. And I didn't even realize until we were starting doing interviews about this record that both those songs have a silent part at the end or a part where I'm not singing and the music is kind of takes over. And so I'm really happy with those two because I think they're kind of two pole, you know, one's on side A, one's on side B. And they kind of, uh, yeah, they kind of sum up the, from going from grief and depression to hopefulness, you know. The narrative arc on those two songs uh, is very, uh, if I can say so, pretty well done. The author was, the next thing I was going to ask about is like the other side of that coin. Obviously that, yeah, that last line, like you're, you're mourning your mother, but you're also moving on. And like at the, the song ends with that pretty simple, like poignant message, just uh, like kiss the ones that love you for the song you sing. That revelation, like, you think that that was possible for you because you're engaged now and you're in like a serious romantic relationship? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be a lot harder if I if I was lonely and had nobody. I think that's why we can probably talk about it later. Like why Rain Garden is the first love song that I've ever written, and we definitely like we got engaged during COVID and all that. So like during these darkest times, it was kind of a way out to like, well, I feel like shit. I think I'm a piece of shit. But this person cares about me, and I need to clean myself up a little bit and at least attempt to try to find the good in life because this person is willing to be there for me, and I need to be there for them. And I can't, you know. In the past, maybe I'd be like, well, they love me for who I am. Uh, I guess I can be a, a miserable bastard, you know. This was more like, well, you got to kind of at least attempt to try to make the world that you want to live in. I would hope that we kind of get there in a in an interesting way where it's not just like, you know what the answer is? Love. <laughs> because I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. But, you know, I think with the music that they wrote, I kind of had to follow like the way it was making me feel emotionally. And it was giving, it was giving me hope, you know, at least the songs in the second half were the more, you know, upbeat ones. The love is I mean, I think it definitely does get there in an interesting way. Like, I mean, I specifically really like uh, Pola Krillek's Kid, which kind of like asked that question, like, can you hate yourself and still deserve love? And then, as you said, Rain Garden sort of answers it, like, I am deserving of love. So, yeah, I mean, you've, you've already discussed some of it, but like not to get too deep in the therapist couch. But can you like tell me about like sort of that that process of like discovering like your worthiness to be loved and like how like, I mean, you, you just said like part of it was realizing you had to do something about it and you couldn't just expect people to love you for being, you know, miserable. Yeah. And, and but that's the thing is, that's the interesting thing is when you're in Proto-Martyr and your, your fans kind of like the fact that you are depressed, you know, or like you, you're able to capture that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty uh, miserable person, you know, and so it's, it helps, it makes it easier to write about that stuff. That's why, um, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> I kind of lost it. Tell me about more about like sort of like that process of like deciding you need to like do something about, you know, hating yourself in order to feel like you really deserved love. Well, like Paula Kulik's kid, you know, I think it's, I always try to write these, uh, these big, uh, like fist pumping, you know, the trick is to try to write a good workout song and then people will play you on Spotify. But the problem is then you have to write the lyrics and you're not like a, you can do it guy. You're not like a achieve your dreams fella. So you have to talk about like, I'm back. Uh, but now I still have to pay bills and nobody applauds you for that. And I still, we're on the road and it's a miserable, you know, it can be very miserable and you're away from home. Meanwhile, people are like, why don't you play my town? And you're like, well, we're on, you know, <laughs> we financially can't, you know. And so it's, the reality creeps in to that song. And it's just like the reality of uh, being myself. And then do I have enough to offer? Like, I, I don't think so. And so... Am I deserving of love? And then, yeah, and so that's kind of the start of the start of actually thinking about it. And then the next couple of songs kind of talk about different things. And it's really just like the author being like, you know, your mom taught you about love and about uh, being a good person and trying to live a good life. And so why not 
take a lesson from her as opposed to denying it. Try to, you know, let that into your life. And so then the rain garden is like, the rain garden is interesting because the first half, I wanted us to talk about very mundane things. And it's really about me and my fiance going, going to get Taco Bell and sitting in the parking lot and seeing this rain garden and being like, oh, I'm, I'm sitting next to the person that I love. And we're, we're both chowing down on Taco Bell. This is a beautiful moment. You know, and, and then the second half kind of becomes very cosmic and very, you know, almost biblical in its, uh, in its love because that's kind of the way it works is that you, the day to day is very beautiful. And then you can kind of have flights of fancy about how much you love somebody. And that wasn't specifically heavy note, but on a somewhat later note, let's talk about baseball a little bit. 3,800 Tigers is it's an easy win for me because I love baseball and I love double entendres. So like that song is at once like kind of fatalist, like regarding t- tiger extinction, but it's also like nostalgic for like the Lou Whitaker days. And it's also like kind of like futurist, not just futuristic, but it's like dreaming of like the brutal statistics that the analytics guys will will think up by the year 3,800. Um, so like beyond the word tiger, I guess, like I'm wondering how these things all connect in your head. We've been talking for a while about like, oh, I wanted this song to be about my mother and all this stuff. But my favorite songs to write are the songs where I, I have no idea what I'm writing about. And I'm just kind of trying to stay on the back of a very busy rocking song. And like, what what can I shout that will be interesting to me as opposed to like, rock and roll or you know like i love to rock you know and so it was three different things i was thinking about the numbers of tigers and it's it fluctuates you google it and it changes and just like last week we were doing interviews and someone's like you know actually there's been an explosion of the amount of tigers and they're starting to become a problem where they're going into villages and attacking people so i mean i guess that's good news that there's more tigers but you know i always like talking about the tigers there's Two things specifically, 84 was the you know, last time I won the World Series, and I was just the right age for it, where I was just about to start playing Little League, so it was like, oh, wow, you know, like, this is the, the best, and those days are gone. We've never, we've come close once, but since then, it's been, you know, in the last, uh, I guess that was like 2007, 2008, so it's almost as long as we, longer than we've been a band, the Tigers have pretty much sucked, so it was nostalgia for that period. And then I don't know if you, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, this guy, John Boys, B-O-I-S, who does like uh, statistical videos on YouTube. And he did a, one thing about like the future, the far future of football, where imagines that as taking o- like a game takes over the whole country. And so one goal is on the East Coast and one goal is on the West Coast and people are fighting through. And so I kind of, as a fan of that, I was like, oh, that's baseball in the future because it's changing so much. I find it, you know, I'm a Tigers fan, but I really hate the corporatization of baseball. And it's a, it's a game that's supposed to be, you know, who's going to pay 40 bucks to go see them on a Tuesday afternoon where you we'd go in the stadium and beers are $14 and you can't use cash. You have to use a card and you can't smoke in the stadium. And it's just like, it's, it's been removed from the sport for the everyman and it's become just like anything else, you know, the actual fun and the actual uh, enjoyment of it's being kind of sucked out. I am sort of a fan of the, uh, the pitch clock just because the games, games are getting way too long. We, we were just in England and there people were trying to explain the, uh, the pleasures of watching cricket. And I kind of latched onto the fact that like until this, this clock thing, both baseball and cricket don't have a set time. They're one of the rare sports that could take forever. I kind of like that kind of, that speed is, is we're kind of losing that in modern society, that kind of slower, slow down speed. So that was kind of, a, uh, in the future, what the fuck is it going to be? It's going to be like a, a cloud where you can't even see through it. And there's somewhere inside, there's some violence happening and the crowds are screaming. And then the last little bit of thing that I want to throw in was there was a fellow that used to be outside of Tiger Games and he kind of brought back the eat em up tigers chant. Uh, he was like a street fella. And it, people really kind of took to him and, and loved him. And then he was uh, he got hit in a, uh, a hit and run. Uh, it was actually two uh, fellas that were like well known in Detroit. So like anything to evoke his, uh, his memory is a nice thing. So it was a bunch of different things. And I wanted to make fun of the White Sox a little bit. But since we play Chicago so much, I'm going to say it's the Red Sox. And then when I'm in Boston, I'm going to say it's the White Sox. And then anywhere else, I'm just not going to say nothing. 
that song has, like I'd say, a bit of nostalgia for the old Tigers. I mean, I maybe I'm reading my projecting into it because I, I mean, you, you hate the corporatization of baseball. I really hate analytics as well. Just like I really, I hate hearing about them. I hate, I hate like that. That's to me like anti-baseball in a way too, because it's just like, yeah. I understand it as an aspect of baseball, but I don't need to know about like, oh, that guy's got a good war. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't need to have people reduced down to these numbers. Maybe it's because I don't really like math very much, but I'm drawn more to the personality of baseball and that sort of thing. I understand its place, but uh, yeah, it's just, baseball is maybe for nerds, but it, it really makes it seem like it's far too dorky and nerdy of a sport for anyone to get into. When it should be about stealing bases and, you know, dingers, you know, <laughs> I don't know. The different part of the album you've got fun in high school your bio describes as like an anti-nostalgia anthem that's like a pretty venomous track i'd say especially for this album which is maybe less venomous than most part of my albums i say the f word on it a couple times which (laughs) covered my ears actually but uh, thank you yes uh so i'm wondering if that like that venom is directed like at your own nostalgia which like you know would track with your generally like self-deprecating lyricism or like how i read it which is kind of just like a, a pure hate track for like the local jocks who peaked in high school i mean it's definitely about that it's the guys that wear their uh, their Letterman jackets from high school. If you're as old as I am, you don't see it anymore. But I definitely remember seeing, like, in my 20s, seeing a guy like, is he still wearing his high school fucking varsity? That's, like, the saddest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I think it's an insult to say, well, at least you had fun in high school. Because I think for the most part, people don't. And if they have, like, a rosy idea of, like, oh, when I was young, everything was, you didn't know what the fuck was going on and the amount of, like, mental stress you were going through. But I also, you know, kind of, you got to throw yourself in there a little bit. And what was great about that song is that was one where we had an idea for it and Greg wasn't 100% sold on it. And, you know, it, it could have worked. It could have, it could have been one that we, we trashed. But what we did was we did the vocals for uh, 3,800 Tigers. And that was like pretty late at night and we started drinking. So then it was like, well, let's try to do the... Uh, lyrics to fun in high school and i was like i, don't, I really don't have too many lyrics for it and like oh joe have another drink okay let's do it <laughs> so it was a lot of like doing passes and like we're all kind of like figuring out how to like sculpt this song and greg pretty much like takes all the guitars out and is just doing like live kind of synth and mixing shit and it's just like i love that it kind of came to, together in the studio and it allowed me to kind of just go off and you know one thing I always, and everybody says this, is that in a studio, a studio is a very antiseptic place, and you really kind of want to capture the feeling of doing a song live, and it's never that way because it's like split up into such a, a boring thing, that when you can kind of capture a little bit of that live energy, then you really want to hold on to it. One of my favorite parts of Proto Martyr has always been the drums. I mean, Alex is obviously an incredible drummer. Yeah, I think I think that song was like, I mean, I know we've, we've talked very little about, I've asked you very little about the music on the album, but um, that song might have been my favorite, especially with the drum track. Yeah, this is like the first record where Greg is officially listed as co-producer. And it's always been a thing from the beginning is that we always have pretty specific wants and needs. Like we know what we kind of want to sound right. And we like working with producers that usually aren't your typical rock producers or your typical post-punk producers or whatever. But we also like people that are willing to like collaborate and kind of like give us suggestions and push back on us, but not, I've heard stories, luckily we haven't had one where it's like, our producer can be like, do that one again, like rewrite this song, like change this verse, like they, they're like heavy handed. And so it was like finally time where we said, like, oh yeah, Greg, you know, Greg should have a point. And it's much easier because like Jake Aaron, who worked on this is like, we specifically wanted him because like he like mixed like the Lorraine record and kind of like some like modern R&B where there's a lot going on, but it doesn't seem like a, just a, you know, mush of different things. It's like direct, but also can be like a headphone record. So yeah, he was great to work with. And what Greg brought to the table was very good. And then with Alex, it's always like, the song is not a song until 
Alex figures out how to drum over it. Greg can like do a demo or something or it has like a shitty drum machine. And then it's like, no, no, no. Alex will come in and like add to it. It's like, okay, that's a proto martyr song. Scott has some good bass lines on the record too. Not to, yeah. not to leave him out of this whole thing. No, no. I was like, who else is in the band? Oh yeah, Scott. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, Scott's the, uh, you know, the, the wild card. He's the secret, the, the secret. You speaking on like, puns there are some great ones about capitalism on this record there's uh fulfillment center which is kind of like the perfect title for a proto martyr track i think um there's less tip the creator which reminds me of that video that guy made about like how we should tip our landlords and then there's even like elimination dances which you've called a metaphor for life but also like feels very relevant to like the corporate rat race um so like you spent like half a lifetime living in detroit which is sort of like the a lot of people consider it like the microcosm of american capitalist decline and i'm wondering like what parts of our current stage of late capitalism feel like the most surreal or even like kind of darkly funny to you? Well, let's tip the creator's title comes from, uh, I'm sure you've seen it when Mark Zuckerberg unveiled the, uh, the metaverse and he did a, he had a video where he's like, I know I'm going to go in. He's hanging out with his friends and they're like, they're playing a card game. It's like, Oh, we gotta go meet our friend. He's, they're in a virtual part of the city. They go and they say, Oh, look at this street art. It's so amazing. We should tip the artist. And they like, What's happening right now is like all this uh, AI stuff. I find it so amazing that these tech people, the first thing they go after is art. Like, oh, my AI can replicate paintings and songs and things like that. You know, that to me is just shows you the hubris of these people where art is an expression of the human soul. What's not an expression of the human soul is being a CEO of a fucking company. AI could probably do that could probably be able to pay your bills, you know, give, give out paychecks to their workers, figure out where to cut costs much better than, you know, so I think it's so funny that these soulless people always kind of go after the thing with the most soul. That was Proto Martyr's Joe Casey talking to the Faders' Raphael Helfand. Proto Martyr's new album, Formal Growth in the Desert, drops this Friday, June 2, via Domino. The Fader interview is engineered by Tony Giambroni. The executive producer is Alex Robert Ross, and the associate producer is Raphael Helfand. We'd like to thank Loudton Audio for providing our microphones. You can find them online at lautenaudio.com. And we'd like to thank James Ivey for providing our intro music. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd appreciate if you left a five-star rating and review. And keep an eye on thefader.com for essential music news, interviews, and essays. We'll be back next week with another episode of The Fader Interview. Goodbye until then. You know that one song you can't get enough of? Chances are it was made with a sample from Splice. Explore top packs made by your favorite producers, sketch out song ideas in seconds with Create Mode, and dive into a sample catalog that's so deep, it's dangerous. Find out why Splice is the industry's not-so-secret secret. Visit splice.com and try for free today.